accepting my invitation uh, to talk us to talk to us about uh, Ramadan, the virtues of Ramadan, and the good deeds uh, in Ramadan, and what are they uh, that we should increase in in Ramadan. The, uh, we we appreciate uh, uh, your your being here with us tonight, the, uh, Sheikh Farouk. Uh, we would like you to start with uh, virtues of Ramadan and tell us some of the authentic narrations from our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and as well the ayat that Allah has revealed in the uh, the in the Quran. So um, uh, I'll let you, Brother Farooq, Sheikh Farooq, to uh, take us through those ayat and the hadith and tell us about Ramadan, please. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah feek wa jazakallah khairan, Imam Abdul Ahad. May Allah bless you and may Allah reward you and the community for sending us this great invitation in which we can discuss some very important issues and matters related to this upcoming month of Ramadan, which we will be starting our uh, first day of fasting by the will and the hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this Tuesday. As there has been no moon sighting reported throughout the world, and based on the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi فَإِنْ غُبِّيَ عَلَيْكُمْ أَوْ غَمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَكْمِلُوا عِدَّةَ الشَّعْبَانِ ثَلَاثِينَ يَوْمًا أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم He said, fast for the sighting of the moon and break your fast for the sighting of the moon and if it is difficult for you to see the moon, the new moon or there it's cloudy where you cannot see it or it's impossible for you to see the new moon then complete the month of Sha'ban, 30 days. So today is the 29th day of Sha'ban, and tomorrow will be the 30th day of Sha'ban, which will be Monday. And we will start and commence Ramadan, insha'Allah ta'ala, on Tuesday. Saudi Arabia tried to sight the moon, and they were not able to. I haven't heard any reports from any other countries throughout the world, but they had announced that Tuesday will be the starting of the blessed month of Ramadan. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it a month filled with goodness, filled with reward, filled with actions of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and closeness. Amen. And we thank Allah for giving us this opportunity to be here with you and all of our listeners here this evening. And we thank Abdul Ahad for taking out the time for facilitating this gathering this evening. We ask Allah to make it beneficial to all and place it on our scale of good deeds on the day of resurrection. So as Amen. Imam Abdul Ahad mentioned, tonight we're going to be discussing some of the virtues of Ramadan, some of the ahkam, some of the rulings and legislations related to the month of Ramadan, related to fasting and other actions of worship which we should be performing in the month of Ramadan and then we will open up the floor for questions and answers. So we're going to go as long as time permits us to go. We want to try to cover a lot of topics, a lot of information during this discussion. So we ask all of our brothers and sisters that if you have your questions, write them down, have your notepads ready and anything related to Ramadan, anything related to fasting, anything related to anything which is associated with the month of Ramadan, we will try to answer those questions here this evening. So, as we all know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us to be within the folds of Islam and be those who have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Islam. And one of the most important things as being a Muslim is that we submit our hearts, we submit our souls, and we submit our limbs to everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do and wants us to refrain from. And we know that in order for somebody to be a Muslim, 
they need to first and foremost accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their Lord and the only one who is deserving of their worship. And then after that, they are trained how to make wudu, how to purify themselves, and then they are instructed about how to pray. Then if they perfect their prayer and master their prayer, then they are instructed to pay the zakat, 2.5% of their earnings yearly, if their savings has reached the taxable amount. Then after that is fasting the month of Ramadan, which is an obligatory fast. As it came in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, he said that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Buniya al-Islamu ala khamsin. Shahadati in la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah wa iqam al-salat wa ita'i zakat wa sawm ramadan wa al-hajji bayt wa hijj al-bayt man istata'a ilayhi sabila kama jaa fi riwayat al-ukhra. He said that Islam is based upon five pillars. The first one being the shahadatain. Testifying that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and testifying that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is Allah's final servant and messenger. Then establishing the prayer the way that we're supposed to with all of its arkan and all of its shurut and all of its wajibat and all of the sunan. Then establishing the zakat, the obligatory charity. Then after that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he said the fourth pillar is fasting the month of Ramadan. And the last pillar of Islam is to make Hajj, make the pilgrimage to Mecca for those who have the ability to do so. So in order for somebody to be considered Muslim, they need to practice these five pillars of Islam. If they leave one off, then they cannot be considered a Muslim if they don't have an excuse to leave them off. So Ramadan... Fasting Ramadan is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed for us. Once we enter into the folds of Islam, then we need to start practicing in adhering to these pillars. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He prescribed fasting for us just as He prescribed fasting for the previous nations before us. Not only are the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam those who it is or was obligatory upon them to fast, but also the previous nations, the nations of Musa, the nations of Isa, the nations of many of the other prophets and messengers who came before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As Allah subhanahu wa taala tells us about this in the Quran, in His statement, "Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun." Allah He says, "O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you, just as it has been prescribed for those who came before you, so that you may attain piety, so that you may attain righteousness, so that you may attain closeness and consciousness of Allah." Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So fasting, abstaining from, refraining from things. As we know, the meaning of fasting linguistically means to just abstain from something. It can be abstaining from speech, abstaining from food, abstaining from drink, abstaining from uh, going to a certain place. And when we look into the Qur'an, how the word as or as was used in the Qur'an, we find the statement of Maryam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, when she said, إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلْرَّحْبَانِ sawma," that indeed I took a vow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to refrain or abstain from something, to al-kaf wal imsak. This is the linguistic meaning of the word as And we see in this verse that Maryam alayhi salam, when she said that she will abstain from something, she took a vow to Allah to abstain from something, was her abstaining from something food or drink or intimacy? As we know that the 
technical or religious meaning of the word Assam is in Islam. But we find that she took a vow to abstain and refrain from speaking to people with for a certain period of time. So when we understand the meaning of Psalm from the Qur'an, even the linguistic aspect, it has a direct relation with the technical and the religious aspect as well. And we will go and shed some light upon this very important topic, inshallah, in this lecture this evening. So Psalm, when we look at it in the technical meaning, it means to, or the religious meaning, it means to refrain or stay away from consuming food, drink, and having intimate or sexual relations with your spouse. But there are many different levels of fasting. There is the bare minimum level of fasting. Then there is a higher level of fasting. And then there is the highest level of fasting. So you have good, better, and best levels of fasting. And for each level, there are more rewards and more ajr. And you will find yourself getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you start implementing these other levels of fasting. But the bare minimum level of fasting that all Muslims have to practice and implement is at least abstain from food and drink and intimacy from the time of Fajr all the way up until the time of sunset. But there are other levels of fasting. There are higher and better levels of fasting, abstaining from things, refraining from things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to abstain from and stay away from. So just how we have different levels of believers and different levels of Muslims within the folds of Islam, the same way we have different levels of fasting. The believers and the Muslims, their levels of Iman and their levels of Islam and following the Sunnah is, is differs. It differs. Some people have high levels of Iman. Some people have lower levels of Iman. Similarly, when we practice our fasting. So you have in Islam, you have the Muslim, you have the Mu'min, and you have the Muhsin, as it came in the Hadith of Jibreel. The Muhsin is the highest level that somebody who is within the folds of Islam can reach. It is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as though you see Allah. But even though you cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over you and supervising and overseeing all of the affairs. And then the second level is the mukmin, the believer, the one who has certainty, and he doesn't have any doubts about any of the pillars of faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to believe in. Then you have the Muslim, the one who practices the five pillars of Islam outwardly. He outwardly looks and practices and tries to adhere to the five pillars of Islam as a Muslim. But the Muslim is not like the Mu'min. The Mu'min is a higher level. He practices the five pillars of Islam outwardly and apparently, but he also has that certainty and that higher level of faith. He has no doubt about belief in the angels or no doubt about belief in Allah, no doubt about belief in the prophets or messengers or the day of resurrection or the Qadr. And then the Muhsin is the highest level. So to try to train ourselves and nurture ourselves in our Iman, in our Islam, we have to try to strengthen our Iman, strengthen our connection with Allah, strengthen our connection with the Book of Allah, strengthen our connection with the Masajid, strengthen our connections with the people of knowledge, so that we can go from being just Muslims to being Mu'min, to being true believers, and then from being Mu'mineen to Muhsineen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to attain these great higher levels in this month of Ramadan. So the levels of fasting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to try to acquire and attain in this month of Ramadan are not only abstaining from food and drink and intimacy from the time of Fajr until the time of Maghrib. This is the bare minimum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to 
abstain and refrain from other things as well. And we find this within the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We find that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that there are some things that if you do them while you are fasting, then there is no need for you to abstain from food and drink. There is no need for you to stay up at night. There is no need for you to have hunger pains during the day if you are not abstaining or refraining from other things which may be de detrimental to your Islam and detrimental to your Iman. So we're going to talk about some of these things as well. So let us first start off with talking about the levels of fasting. The first level of fasting is, as I mentioned, and the meaning of fasting in the Arabic language and according to the Sharia is to abstain from food and drink and intimacy from the time of Fajr all the way up until the time of Maghrib. This is the bare minimum that every Muslim has to practice if they are not from amongst the people who may have excuses from the elderly, from those who may be breastfeeding, from those who are pregnant and may be worried about themselves or worried about their children. We'll talk about that a little later. So that's the bare minimum that all of us have to adhere to and are obliged to practice. Then you have a second level. The second level is the higher level. The ones who are going to have more consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while they are abstaining from food and drink and intimacy during the day. This type of abstaining or refraining, it incorporates other parts of our body besides our stomach, besides our tongues and our mouths, which is used for consuming food and digesting food and tasting food and things like that. The second level is that which the external limbs will also have their role and their part in playing a very important part in abstaining and refraining from things. So the second level is when our hearts refrain from thinking about evil things during the month of Ramadan. When our eyes refrain and abstain from looking at things which are haram, that we should not be looking at, whether it's on the internet, whether it's on movies. Many countries, unfortunately, in the month of Ramadan, they come out with new musalsalat. They come out with new uh, drama series or opera or soap operas or whatever they are in the month of Ramadan. Why? To try to distract the Muslims to get them away from looking into the Qur'an, from get them away from listening to the Qur'an, from get them away from going to the masajid and praying tarawih at night. They want them to sit in their house and watch these drama series that they have newly released. So the second level of fasting is our tongues fasting and abstaining from foul speech, from lying, from cheating, from backbiting, from slandering, from ghiba, from namima, rumor spreading slandering, cursing, our eyes fasting from looking at things we're not supposed to be looking at, our ears fasting from listening to the speech of shaitan, our ears fasting from listening to gossip and rumor spreading and backbiting and slandering and cursing, our feet fasting and abstaining from going to places that we shouldn't be going, shouldn't be going to the nightclub, shouldn't be going to the bars, shouldn't be going to the, the, the liquor stores. Our hands abstaining from acquiring wealth unlawfully through riba, through deceiving, through cheating, through lying. This is the second level of fasting, of abstaining, of refraining that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to attain and acquire. And we have proofs for this in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he even told us and advised us and warned us. He said that, مَن لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ فِي أَنْ يَضَعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ كَمَا قَالَ النَّبِي sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told us the importance of refraining from falling into the muharramat while we are fasting. 
He said, whoever does not abandon or refrain from false speech, from foul speech, from lying, from cursing, from slandering, from talking bad about people, from talking bad to our parents, disrespecting them, dishonoring them, lying to our employers or lying to our employees, anything related to our tongue. If we do not abandon false speech with our tongues in the month of Ramadan while we are fasting, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need for us to abandon our food and our drink. Meaning that our abandoning the food and drink and intimacy during the days of Ramadan, maybe we may be doing it for nothing. Just experiencing hunger pains and sleeplessness. As the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said in another hadith, رُبَّ الصَّائِمٍ لَيْسَ, ليس لَهُ مِنْ صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا جُوعٍ وَرُبَّ قَائِمٍ لَيْسَ مِنْ قِيَامِهِ إِلَّا السَّهْرِ He said that perhaps there could be someone who is fasting, somebody who is abstaining from food and drink and intimacy during the day. And he attains or acquires nothing from doing this except hunger pains, thirst, and feeling hungry. His stomach is grumbling. This is the only thing that he acquires. He has no reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because he is engaged in backbiting and slandering and doing all of the other haram things that he shouldn't be doing, not only outside of Ramadan, but also in Ramadan as well. And in the hadith it says, there could be perhaps somebody who is praying the night prayer and he doesn't attain anything. He doesn't get any reward from his night prayer. He doesn't get any benefit from it except from sleeplessness and tiredness because he is still engaging in haram things while he is in the month of Ramadan and fasting. So these two hadith right here show us that trying to acquire and attain the second level of fasting that we mentioned is one of the main important types of fasting that we need to try to acquire and adhere to in this month of Ramadan. Because it's very easy for us to not drink or not eat or not have intimate relations with our spouses. But it's very difficult for many to abandon the muharramat during the month of Ramadan while we are abstaining from food and drink. And this is the whole purpose of fasting. This is what is going to train our iman and reconnect ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reconnect ourselves with the speech of Allah, the Qur'an. Reconnect ourselves with the brothers who are upon righteousness. This is one of the main goals of the month of Ramadan. As we mentioned in the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said that fasting has been prescribed for us and then He gave us the reason as to why fasting has been prescribed for us. Why is fasting has why has fasting been prescribed for us so that we can cut down our grocery bill so that we can lose some weight so that we can uh, have a lot of food stored in our freezer cuz we're not eating as much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us in that verse in surah al-baqarah he says la'allakum tattaqun he says, fasting has been prescribed for you just as it has been prescribed for the nations before you so that you may perhaps attain taqwa. You may perhaps attain piety. You may become righteous. You may become upon your deen. You may leave off the things, the muharramat, and come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reason of our fasting. This is the reason of our reciting Qur'an. This is the reason of us coming to the masjid to pray tarawih. This is the reason why we feed the fasting people. This is the reason why we increase in our charity in the month of Ramadan. So that لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may attain taqwa. You may attain piety. You may attain more consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that you will try to acquire the the... The, the level of the muhsineen, where you're worshipping Allah as though you see Allah, but he, you don't see Him, but you're knowing that He sees you. This is taqwa. Taqwa is making a barrier between yourself and the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A waqaya, a protection, a barrier. And we even have this protection or barrier mentioned 
in the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as it comes in many narrations in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentions in the beginning of the hadith, he says, "Kullu amali ibni Adam li, ah, kullu amali ibni Adam lahu illa siyam, fa inna hu li wa ana ajzi bi." He says that all of the actions of worship that human beings do, the reward is for them. The reward is mentioned. The reward is there for them. Except for one type of thing, one type of action of worship, which is special for me. I am going to give the servant a special reward. And this is fasting. Fasting is the type of worship that I will reward the servant for. As we know, many of the other good deeds that we do from charity and prayer and making hajj and making umrah and fighting for the sake of Allah and reading Quran, we get anywhere from tenfold to seven hundredfold the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in this hadith, the Prophet Muhammad or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions because it is hadith Qudsi, Allah he mentions that I will reward him. And Allah's mercy is all expansive. And His bounties are endless. So imagine, if other actions of worship are from 10 to 700 fold, what about fasting? Fasting can be more than 700 fold. Allah didn't mention specifically how much He's going to reward us for fasting. Why is the reward for fasting so great? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to give us a special reward and special treatment for fasting? One of the things that the scholars have mentioned is that because fasting is an affair between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, nobody knows that you're fasting, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for the other actions of worship, prayer, people can see you praying. Charity, people can see you giving charity. Hajj, millions of people are there with you making hajj. Umrah, Thousands of people are with you making Umrah. Jihad, hundreds and thousands of people may be with you while you're fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Reciting Quran, people may be there listening to you, may be reciting so that they praise you and say you're good. But fasting, fasting is a secret between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that He is going to reward the fasting person with an abundance of reward because it is only between him and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, in that same hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he goes on to mention, he says, As-siyamu jannah. Ke jannati ahadikum fil qital. Or kema qalun nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, fasting is like a shield. Fasting is as if it is a protection or barrier. So just how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala justified us fasting in the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, that it is to acquire and attain piety. Similarly, we find in the Hadith Qudsi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizing and explaining how fasting can be acquired and what it does for us in this world and the next, how it provides a protection for us, a shield for us. If you ever imagine being on the battlefield and standing in rows with your soldiers against the enemies who are also in rows and everybody has their artillery, their armor, their shields. Shields are going to protect you from the enemy's arrows, the enemy's spears, the enemy's rocks, whatever they throw at you. If you have the shield, you're going to be able to block it. Same thing with fasting. Fasting is that not only which protects you in this dunya, protects you from evil, the evil temptations of shaitan and his agents from amongst the jinn and humankind, but also in the hereafter. Fasting is a shield and a barrier which will protect us from the hell fire. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, مِنْ صَامَ يَوْمًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بَعَدَ اللَّهُ وَجَّهُ عَنَ النَّارِ سَبْعِينَ خَرِيفًا Or كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم He says, whoever fasts one day for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will distance that person 70 years from the hellfire. And in another narration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yada'a khandaqan baynahu wa bayna nar masafat ma bayna samawati wal ard. And another narration, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, whoever fasts for him one day for his sake, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place a khandak, a trench, between him and the hellfire, the distance of between the earth and the heavens. So this is part of the protection, part of the barrier, the jannah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us in the hereafter. But what about here in this dunya? As they say, Al-Himyatu Ratz dawa Prevention is the top or the main reason or the main cause of seeking medicine or one of the greatest medicines, preventive medicine. So when we fast, it naturally, number one, there's so many benefits in fasting. And now you'll find that even people who exercise or, or, or modern day scientists and doctors and physicians, they will tell you that Intermittent fasting is good for anybody who's working out to lose weight, to clear their arteries, to decrease diabetes, to decrease cancer, any type of ailments or illnesses. You will find that now all non-Muslims and many people are practicing intermittent fasting and fasting, right? Water fasts and things like this. But Alhamdulillah, Muslims, we have been fasting, Alhamdulillah, abstaining from food and drink throughout the day, during the days of Ramadan, and even the voluntary fast, more than 1400 years ago, our Prophet Muhammad wasallam told us about this, and taught us about this. So Alhamdulillah, we're not, but we're fasting for, as an action of worship, to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time, still attaining and acquiring, those physical and mental and intellectual benefits, from the fasting. But, those who haven't entered into the fold of Islam, they are just fasting for the benefits of their body or their mind. They're not getting any reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us as the ummah or as Muslims to retain a lot of reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this shield that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us, naturally when you eat or you consume food, you find that your blood circulates through your body quicker. The more food you eat, why do people who go exercise, they always fill up on protein and energy drinks and things like that. Why? So that they have a lot of energy. And when sometimes you have a lot of energy, it leads you to go overboard sometimes or go to excessiveness in some things. Do things, you get a rush in your head, a caffeine rush or something like that, right, that people have, right, and it maybe sometimes leads them to do things that they wouldn't normally do, or be influenced in ways that they were not normally influenced, but when your food, when your stomach is empty, and there's no food in it, no sugar, number one, it's getting rid of all of the toxins that are in your body, alhamdulillah, a purification, a means of purification, but at the same time, your blood is slowing down, and we know the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he mentioned in the hadith that the shaitan, number one, is closer to us than our jugular vein. And in another hadith, that the shaitan runs through the veins of Ibn Adam. So we know that the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that when we get angry, what happens to your body? It gets hot. So what did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa advise us to do? He said, sit down, make wudu. If you're sitting, lay down. If you're standing, sit down. If you're walking, if you're running, walk. If you're walking, sit down. All to calm the body down. So this is one of the great effects that fasting has on the body, is that it slows the circulation of blood throughout your body. That's why you'll find many of us may experience fatigue during the days of fasting. So it keeps your brain and your mind and your body and your soul focused upon, number one, why you are fasting, focusing and being able to concentrate more upon the recitation of the Qur'an, focusing more upon listening to the recitation of the Qur'an, 
pondering over it, reflecting over it when you go to the tarawih or when you're listening to it in your house. So alhamdulillah, there's just numerous benefits. We could sit here for hours talking about the benefits and the fawaid of, of fasting. But we want to focus on the point that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, As-siyamu jannah, that fasting is a protection. So we mentioned some of the ways that it's a protection, but there are also other ways. There's also guidance that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam gave us and how to deal with our society or those who we interact with while we are fasting. Sometimes when people get fast, they get irritable. Sometimes there may be somebody and he doesn't know you're fasting. He wants to argue. He wants to debate with you. He wants to fight with you. So what did the Prophet Muhammad wasallam tell us to do? He said in an authentic hadith. He said, As-siyamu jannah. Fasting is a protection, is a shield. فَلَا يَرْفُثْ وَلَا يَجْهَلْ وَلَا يَسْخَبْ كَمَا جَارْتْ فِي الرِّوَايَةِ وَإِنْ إِمْرُؤٌ قَاتَلَهُ أَوْ شَاتِمْهُ فَلِيَقُلْ إِنِّي سَائِمٌ إِنِّي سَائِمٌ So he said, fasting is a protection and a shield. So someone should not engage in any type of foul speech, whether it's swearing, raising your voice, slandering, cursing, talking back to your parents. وَلَا يَجْهَلْ Right? Nor should he do something which are from the acts of ignorance. Do something based upon not having knowledge. And if somebody comes to you and they want to fight with you or argue with you, then you should tell them, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. You are not going to engage in their things which may ruin your fast or may remove much of the reward of your fast during the month of Ramadan. So, Alhamdulillah, there are many virtues about fasting the month of Ramadan and the fada of the virtues of Ramadan itself. So let us start off first talking about some of the virtues of the month of Ramadan. We have numerous hadith, but we don't have enough time to talk about all of the virtuous issues related to the month of Ramadan. Some of them is that fasting the month of Ramadan will be an expiation for our previous sins. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he said, مَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانْ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمْ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ He said, whoever fasts Ramadan with sincerity and iman and seeking Allah's reward truly, then he will be forgiven of his previous sins. But remember now, the fasting that is mentioned here in the Sunnah is not just the fasting restricted to abstaining from food and drink and intimacy. It is the higher level of fasting, the level two of fasting that we mentioned in the beginning of this lecture. Also, from the virtues of this month of Ramadan is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Whenever the month of Ramadan or whenever a good season or an opportunity to attain many rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was available, the Prophet would always give his companions the glad tidings of this upcoming season which is coming. And we find this in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which he says, Atakum Ramadan shahrun mubarak farad Allahu azza wa jal alaykum siyamu tuftahu fihi abwabu sama." وَتُغْلَقُ فِيهِ أَبْوَابُ الْجَحِيمِ وَتُغُلُّ فِيهِ مَرَدَةُ الشَّيَاطِينِ لِلَّهِ فِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٍ مَنْ حُرِمَ خَيْرَهَا فَقَدْ حُرِمْ And in another narration, it mentions that إِذَا كَانَ أَوَّلُ لَيْلَةٍ مِنْ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ صُفِّدَةَ الشَّيَاطِينِ وَمَرَدَةَ الْجِنِّ وَفُتِّحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ جَهَنَّمْ وَلَمْ يُفْتَحْ مِنْهَا بَابْ وَيُنَادِ مُنَادٍ يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبِلْ وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرِّ أَقْسِرْ وَلِلَّهِ أُتَقَاءُ مِنَ النَّارِ وَذَلِكَ كُلُّ لَيْلًا So in these two narrations, we have one of them, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told his companions, he says, Now has come to you the blessed month of Ramadan. 
Allah has obliged and made it necessary upon you to fast the month of Ramadan. In it, when the start of Ramadan comes, the gates, the doorways of the heavens are opened and the doors of the hellfire are closed and the shayateen, whether they are from amongst the jinn or humankind, they are chained up and fettered up. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has one night within the month of Ramadan, which is better worshipping Him in that night, better than a thousand months. And whoever has been deprived of attaining and acquiring that blessed night, the night of decree, then he has been deprived of a lot of goodness. And in the other narration it mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up all the doors of the paradise and doesn't leave one door closed and, and closes all the doors to the hellfire and doesn't leave one door of the hellfire open. And a caller calls out and says, O oh, you who want to do good, come forward. O oh, you who want to do bad, refrain from doing your bad. And every night in the month of Ramadan, Allah has those whom He frees from the hellfire. So we ask Allah to make us from those people of goodness. Those who yuqbiluna ala ta'at wa yatrukuna sayyat. Those who Amen. move forward to proceed upon good acts. And those who abandon all of the bad acts that we may have been doing before the month of Ramadan. So, other virtues as well in the month of Ramadan, as we mentioned, that they are a kafara for the dhunub. They are expiation for the sins. Not only fasting the month of Ramadan, but also praying the month of Ramadan. As the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he said, Man qama Ramadan iman al that whoever stands up for prayer in the month of Ramadan, then with true sincerity and faith and seeking Allah's reward, then his previous sins will be forgiven. And then he said in another hadith, Men qama laylatul qadr iman and wahtisaba He said that whoever prays the night of decree, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also forgive him of his sins. But remember, all of these things have to be done with what? Iman and wahtisaba. They have to be done with true and sincere and certain faith while seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, not the pleasure of anybody else. Not that you're going to tarawih to please the imam or to please your dad or to please your mom or to please your brothers or sisters or just to break fast or to eat the delicious food. Right? This is something that we always have to ask ourselves. Before we do any action of worship, why are we doing this action of worship? Right? Tashiyah To rectify your intentions. Before anything you do, ask yourself, why am I doing it? Why am I praying tarawih, 20 rakats at the masjid tonight? Because I want everybody to see me being a good Muslim in Ramadan. Why am I bringing? Why am I giving all my charity in front of all the people and passing out money like that? Because I want people to say I'm generous. So these are all things that we need to take into account and analyze our situations and circumstances before we engage in any type of action. So, Farouk. Naam. Uh, can we take a uh, few questions? Yeah, let's try to keep the questions related to fiqh issues, inshallah, if we can, jurisprudence issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think we talked a lot about the virtues. If there, anybody virtues. else has any questions about, um, you know, the virtues and things like that, they can uh, message us and then we'll discuss it later on. But yeah, let's take some questions about some of the ahkam related to uh, everything related to establishing the month of Ramadan. When do we fast? How do we fast? What are some of the adab and manners and etiquettes of fasting? Yeah, tafaddal, tafaddal, mm. Sheikh. If you okay. have some questions, let's, uh, let's go ahead and answer some. Uh, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, sister. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa salam. Okay, so here's the thing. I have a neurological condition where basically I have to drink about three liters of water every day 
uh, in order to balance everything out so I don't have to have brain surgery, <laughs> which is acutely terrifying. Basically, there's flu- way too much fluid in different parts of my body, and I have to balance it. No, um, make it easy how can I? Yeah, how can I fast? Like, okay. I, I still want to fast, but I, I don't know what I should do. Okay, well, if this is a, a type of sickness, so in Islam, and especially in the affairs related to fasting, we have those who come into a category called Ahlul A'adhar. Those who have a valid excuse to not fast. So there are two types of individuals who fall into that category. Those who may be, um, you know, have a type of sickness which there is little hope or the doctors say, well, you are going, this sickness is going to be with you for the rest of your life. For example, maybe somebody who has cancer, right? And they said that, well, there's no cure for this cancer or somebody who has you know, maybe HIV or herpes or, you know, something which may, uh, you know, maybe diabetes, right? Um, some type of well, sickness in which they cannot be cured from it. Yeah, you can maybe take things which may decrease the symptoms and things like that, but there will be no cure and that by fasting, sometimes fasting can increase the sickness and make it more difficult for that person to function in in, in daily life. So right. if your sickness um, is the type which you have had this sickness for a long time and that fasting, abstaining from food and drink during the day is going to make it worse or harm, then you have a valid excuse to not fast. To not fast. And what you do, okay. you actually give a meal to a a poor person for every day that you're not able to fast. So let's say this month of Ramadan is 30 days. You would feed 30 poor people. 30 poor people. And the amount that you would feed a poor person is about, you know, a nice meal for them. Maybe, you know, anywhere from 5 to $15, right? According to what type of food you're giving them to eat. Okay. Yes. Um. Okay, so there's two things. One... Basically, it's a neurological condition called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, they don't; they just don't know. I've had it since I was 21 years old, and it could either disappear magically, or I'll have it until I die. <laughs> like there, there's like there, there's no telling. There, there's no way. There's no cure for it at all. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, so have you tried fasting before while you had you've had this condition? Uh, fasting has been fine. Fasting from food, I still have to drink water. Okay. Like, Can you... So, it has to be water... This is the first time the sister is... Uh, uh, yeah, and it, it's, her, it's her first Ramadan. First Ramadan. Okay, mashallah. So... Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I still have to drink water. Like, I have to drink about two... About two liters of water every day in order to keep everything normal. Okay, so the, my, if I get, my question is, does it have to be during the day or can it be any time throughout? Like early in the morning or after sunset? As long as I drink two, as long as I drink uh, between two and four liters of water by the t- while I'm awake, I'm usually fine. Okay, so this is where you have to, you have to analyze your your ability and your situation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, One thing, alhamdulillah, we're happy and, you know, very, uh, you know, honored to have you uh, be fasting this first uh, Ramadan and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, to make it a cure and a purification for you. Hopefully, it will help you to, uh, you know, maybe get rid of that that sickness. SubhanAllah, fasting has numerous health benefits from it. Um, One thing Mm. that, I would go to consult the doctor, right, if you can, or, you know, even over the phone tomorrow and ask him to be sure. Because if you can consume that water before, because fasting starts at Fajr time. Once the adhan for Fajr comes in, then normally those who are able to fast would not consume any food or any drink and all the way from that time all the way up until Maghrib, as we mentioned. But if you're able mm-hmm. to consume that water, before 
the Fajr time, at the, the Fajr breakfast meal before the Adhan of Fajr, and then also after the Maghrib time, then you could fast. But right. if it's going to cause harm or some type of, you know, uh, neurological disorder and make things worse, then you have the valid excuse to not fast. So I would consult your doctor and ask him mm. or her, you know, what do you think okay. about this? Um, and maybe try it out if you could, you know, maybe try out the first day and see how it goes and then see how you feel. And if you think you can do it and go ahead, do it if you can. But if you can't, then you still have the valid excuse to not fast and feed a poor person for every day that you break your fast. Okay. Um, the second question was relating to the feeding a poor person. I don't have much money. I'm a college student. I can cook. So there you go. what if Alhamdulillah. What about yeah, working at a soup kitchen? Alhamdulillah, that's uh, perfect. What? That's right there. You you know, um whatever maybe you cook a meal for yourself and put you know, make enough for maybe two people, right? And you put right. half of the half of it for you, you eat it and half of it you give uh, you put it in a plate or in a container and you give that either to, you know, maybe one of your neighbors who may be poor or somebody at the soup kitchen. Or maybe if you're in uh, Imam uh, Abdul Ahad's community, I'm sure he knows um, those who are needy and those who may need meals and things like this. So Alhamdulillah, it's uh, it's very easy. Don't uh, okay. be overwhelmed and you know think that you know you have to go to a certain place or a certain organization and things like that. Alhamdulillah, even if you know it was your neighbor or somebody on the street, all of that and Alhamdulillah falls into the category of those who are needy of of food. Alhamdulillah. Right. Because right. um, um, I, I still, if I can't fast, I, I definitely want to feed a poor person, not just for religion, but when money was really tight last year, people helped us out, and I would like to help others now that we're a little bit better off. Alhamdulillah. That's, so. from, that's from the wisdom, and that's from part of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated us to not only fast but to also feed the poor number one the wisdom behind fasting is so that we who have been you know many of us have been blessed with food blessed with shelter blessed with three square meals a day blessed with you know uh, water and juice and soda to drink milk and things like that but during the month of Ramadan Allah wants us to remember those who are less fortunate than us those who don't have the money to buy food and drink and, and have their, their stomachs full every day. So this is part of the wisdom as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated fasting and also legislated feeding and helping the poor so that we put ourselves in their shoes and always remember that, hey, that could be us one day. And shows us the humanity and the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within this beautiful way of life that we call al Islam and that we have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in and we practice in our daily lives. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to aid you, sister, and make it easy for you to fast your first Amen. Ramadan. And if you cannot fast, to make it easy for you to be able to feed the poor. And inshallah, we hope that your condition gets better. Thank you for the Amen. wonderful question. Amen. Thank Allah. you very much. Well, uh, do we have any other questions? from the brothers and sisters on Zoom. Brothers and sisters, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and directly ask the Sheikh. I have some questions for the audience. <laughs> Since they don't have any questions for us, we're going to get on mm. them. Especially a brother from Harrisburg that I know, Muammar, okay. Muammar Ramli. He's here with us this evening. May Allah bless him and bless his family. Amen. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. So we didn't touch on the two pillars of fasting, but the two pillars are very important. Who can tell us what are the two important pillars? And any time we have a pillar, a pillar is something in which must be found within the action of worship. It's a necessity. If one of the pillars is missing, then the action of worship is not accepted. So what are the two important pillars in fasting? 
What are the two important pillars in fasting, brother Ma'amr? Do you know them? You can take it off mute. Um, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam, rahmatullah. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. I'm not sure. I would assume one of the pillars, um, would that be like sincerity? MashaAllah, tabarakallah, Allah Akbar. Asabt al haq MashaAllah. Ahsant, MashaAllah. Yes, that is the most important pillar in fasting. That we have an intention to fast. <laughs> the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he says in an authentic oh. hadith, number one, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتُ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ إِمْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى He says, indeed, actions depend upon their intentions. The reward of our actions depend upon our intentions. And for every action that we do, right, with an intention, you will be rewarded for. So any action of worship we do without an intention then there is a possibility that we will not be rewarded for it. So every action has to have an intention, a sincere intention behind it, that we're doing it only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet, he said in the hadith, he said that whoever does not have an intention to fast before the time of Fajr, then there is no fasting for him. <laughs> so what we understand from this hadith is that once we learn that the month of Ramadan is starting, then we must have that conscious intention to start fasting, to abstain from food and drink and intimacy during the day, and also abstain from those other haram things that we should stay away from as well that we mentioned earlier, backbiting, slandering, lying, right, taking money unlawfully, harming anybody with our hands or with our limbs and things like this, right? So, yeah. alhamdulillah, we must have a sincere intention, right? And Allah, He says in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Bayna, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ He says, and they were not ordered with anything except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincerity. So sincerity and having an intention is one of the pillars of the acceptance of any action of worship that we do. And specifically in this upcoming month of Ramadan, it is a pillar for the acceptance of our fasting. So make sure that you have the intention of fasting from the beginning of the month. And this is the strongest opinion. There's a, two opinions. Uh, the most popular opinion opinions is that one, that you must make your intention to fast every night before Fajr, that you're going to fast that day. That's one opinion. And then there's another opinion that you have to have your intention just from the beginning of the month of Ramadan, and then you engaging in the actions themselves are in abstaining from food and drink are actually considered to be part of your intention to engage in the fasting as well. So the second pillar is what? Very easy. We already mentioned it in the lecture. The first pillar is sincerity. The second pillar is what? Anybody know? What was Remember, we talked about it in the beginning. From the meaning of fasting uh, in the Sharia. Uh, it, it's taqwa. Okay. That's part, I don't think I'm uh, saying uh, it right. MashaAllah. <laughs> that, that goes hand in hand with the first one. Having sincerity and ikhlas. Right? Acquiring and attaining piety. But the second pillar is obtain, abstaining from food and drink and intimacy. From the time of Fajr until the time of Maghrib. So those two, we have to do those. Those are the bare minimum. Remember we mentioned that in the beginning? That's the bare minimum for our fasting to be accepted. Then when we try to get to the second level and third level of fasting, then the reward increases and increases and increases more and more and more and more. So those are the levels that we're trying to get to where our tongues are fasting from bad speech, our eyes are fasting from looking at bad things, our ears are fasting from listening to bad things, our hands are fasting from doing unlawful things, our feet are fasting from going to impermissible places. Then we get more reward. Just like when we pray, when we pray the five prayers in the masjid, in congregation, 
We're all lined up next to each other, right? All the brothers here, lined up, foot to foot, shoulder to shoulder. They all pray the same way, Ruku, Sujud, right? They're all doing the same action, right? But is the reward that they're re that are all receiving the same or different? Different. Different. So what does it depend upon? The intentions. Ah, it depends upon your ikhlas. It depends upon your khushur, your concentration, your focus. Because there's thieves. There's thieves in the masjid. <laughs> They're not the thieves that you see out on the street in the projects, in the ghetto, things like that. These thieves in the masjid, they're more dangerous. These thieves are the shayateen, are the jinn in the shayateen, and those trying to distract you, as the Prophet Muhammad wasallam he said. He said somebody could pray, and they could come out of their prayer with only a tenth reward of their prayer, or maybe a fourth, or a third, or a half. So anytime you're distracted in your prayer, and not focused in your prayer, this is how the shaitan slowly takes away from the rewards in your prayer. Similarly with fasting. Fasting, as I said, right? There's a bare minimum level that everybody has to do, but the more you try to get to the second level, the more reward you have. The more you abstain from the muharramat, the impermissible or prohibited things, the more reward you're going to have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the more success you're going to have in your life you're going to find. So, alhamdulillah. So we mentioned the two pillars. What are some of the things that break your fast? Let's talk about those. Mufattirat. Al Mufattir. Or first of all, Sheikh Abdul Ahad, before we get to that, how how or I think we mentioned it in the beginning, but how is the month of Ramadan established? What do we establish the month of Ramadan entering the what do we establish the first day of Ramadan with? The setting of the new moon. Okay. What about calculations? Uh, I'm sorry, my phone was going in and out. I had to run from the car. Well, go as fast as I can from the car in the barn to the farmhouse to find a place to talk. So I didn't hear that part. How about calculations? Or going by a calendar? Can we do that in Islam or no? We heard the hadith. Uh where you mentioned the Prophet, peace be upon him, and said, Sumu li ru'yatihi wa aftiru li ru'yatihi. And you mentioned the, uh, the riwayah, fa'inna ghubiya alaykum uh, fa'atimmu iddata sha'bana thalathin. From, from, from here, we learn that the Prophet, peace be upon him, has said, fast upon sighting the moon, and break your fast upon sighting the moon. And uh, if for some reason you cannot see in the morning, like uh, if if it's cl the sky is cloudy or, or uh, 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 is not clear, then um, uh, complete the the month of Shaban thirty days. So calculations uh, nowhere, are nowhere in the in the hadith is mentioned the calculation and uh, um, uh, the. Uh, they, um, these are something that uh, the science, uh, um, over years, uh, the, the the Muslims that were not, uh, it was introduced to us. So, what, what was it? What whatever was the dean back then? Then, um, uh, nothing changes, uh, regardless of what happens later on. Alhamdulillah. So, somebody trying to come along and establish the beginning of the month of Ramadan or the ending of the month of Ramadan with astronomical calculations or a calendar or things like that. This is from the newly invented affairs in the religion that the three generations, the Prophet's generation, the generation after them, and the generation after them, never knew about never knew about or never practiced. So we avoid that and we go which that which is easy. Following the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam is easy and it's down to earth and it makes the most sense and it's logical. Anything else will always bring about speculation and doubts and confusion. So the Muslim is always the one who avoids confusion and always strives to practice Islam 
which is very easy and simple to practice. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah Khair, Imam. What are some of the things that break our fast? Let's talk about those. Let's call randomly on some of our other guests here. J, brother J L or sister J L Worthy. Are you with us? We hope you're doing well this evening. May Allah bless you and bless your family. Inshallah. We'd like to hear from you, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind, brother. Thank you. And, um, Alhamdulillah. May you also be blessed in your family. Amen. Uh, as far as breaking the fast, intentionally breaking your fast, like with uh, what you're having a date or water, that type of thing, or something that you didn't mean to break your fast. Oh, mashallah. Excellent question. That's a very, very important point that you mentioned. Alhamdulillah. One thing that we have a general principle that will help us out to determine what are some of the things that break our fast and what are some of the things that don't break our fast. The general principle is that anything consumed through the mouth, which is intentionally consumed and it contains nutrients for the body, then this thing breaks the fast. Okay, is that clear? Anything which is consumed through the mouth which contains nutrients for the body and it's intentionally consumed, then this breaks the fast. So anything which is unintentionally consumed through the mouth, whether it's nutritious or not nutritious, does not break the fast. Alhamdulillah. Is that clear? Very simple yes. principle. Alhamdulillah. So what if you say, for example, you're sitting uh, there sister cooking dinner for the family and you know you're cooking and then you just forgot you're fasting and you you're tasting the soup or the meatballs and you ate like three of them does that break your fast or no <laughs> three of them's a lot uh no i guess if truly i had that not the meatball but we all <laughs> have the candy. with candy one time i was at visiting someone's house and they gave us a candy and i said thank you and i put it in my mouth and I swallowed it and um, I just really forgot like I was just excited about the candy I guess I don't know <laughs> but um, and then I started to then I as soon as I did after I swallowed it I was very upset because I realized like how stupid <laughs> what did I just do and um, at that time uh, the person was with me they asked me they said did you remember before you swallowed it and I said no and so they said that, you know, because truly I didn't remember, they said, well, that's a gift for Allah. He gave you some candy. That's, mashallah, <laughs> that's what came in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, man akala nasiyan wa huwa sa'imun fal yitim sawmahu fa innama at'amahu Allah wa saqahu. The Prophet, he said that whoever eats something out of forgetfulness, he forgot, they forgot, she forgot. While they are fasting, then indeed this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them to drink or given them to eat. Meaning that your fasting is still valid and that anything that we do in Islam, not only fasting or eating while we're fasting, anything we do out of Islam, out of forgetfulness, out of a mistake or things like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold us accountable for. And that is from the beauty of this wonderful Deen that the Prophet he told us he says Rufi an ummati al khata wa nisyan wa ma astukirhu alay. He says anything that this the followers of this ummah any Muslim does, which is out of forgetfulness, out of a mistake, or something that they are coerced coerced to do or forced to do, then this has been removed from him. This has been uplifted from him. He will not be held accountable for anything that he is mistakenly does out of ignorance or they forget or they are coerced or forced to do. So this is from the blessings of this wonderful deen and the mercy of this wonderful deen and the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wants goodness for us, alhamdulillah, in this world and the next. So yes, eating or drinking or taking anything into your mouth that contains nutrients unintentionally or out of forgetfulness does not break our fast. But if you do it intentionally, then it breaks your fast. And this is a major sin. Okay, this is a major sin. If you say, 
you know, you come, uh, you come home and you, you know, you act like, you know, I don't want to fast. I don't have to fast. And you just start drinking and, you know, and eating and acting as though you're fasting and things like this, right? This is very, very dangerous. Okay. What is another thing that breaks our fast? Anybody else can, Ryan. We have uh, uh, someone, Ryan. a guest. Okay, uh, mashallah. Let's hear from them. Intimacy between married couples. Okay, intimacy between married couples. Does this break the fast? It depends on the time. Let's say... Yeah, we're talking about someone who's uh, fasting. Intimacy during the hours of fasting from after mm -hmm. Fajr until Maghrib. Yeah. Yes, that would break the fast. That would break the fast, okay. And it is also a what? A very, very major sin. If you do it intentionally. So there's a difference. And all of the things that break the fast and don't break the fast is if they are intentional or they are unintentional or out of forgetfulness. So the thing with, fat, with, with having intimacy or sexual relations during fasting is that not only does it break the fast, but there's also a obligatory expiation that you must give to make up for that grave sin that you have maybe fallen into during the month of Ramadan. So what is the expiation for somebody who intentionally has intercourse with their spouse during the month of Ramadan? The first thing is that you free a slave. Here in America, right, we don't have people who are uh, bonded into servitude and things like that. I mean, we could sit here and argue, yeah, we're mental slaves to the government or mental <laughs> slaves or whatever. Like that. We're not talking about that, right? Slaves and many cultures and many people throughout the world have been slaves, okay? Romans, Irish, right? Africans used to enslave each other. Arabs used to enslave each other, right? Europeans, right? Oh, this was something normal of the past, right? That was very common. If two tribes got into a conflict, right? The winning tribe would take the losing tribe, take all their wealth, take their family members, take the women, the children, the men, and put them in bondage to be servants of the winning tribes or nations and things like that. So the first thing is to free a slave. If you cannot find a slave to free, what is the, the next step? The next step is fasting 60 days consecutively. And this is one of the expiations, right, of having intercourse with your spouse during the day of Ramadan or while you are fasting in the month of Ramadan. Okay. If you cannot fast two months consecutively, what is the next step? The next step is that if you cannot and not able to do that, then you have to feed 60 masakin. You have to feed 60 people. Okay, you cannot fit fast those 60 days, so now you have to feed 60 people instead. Okay, but the question will come up now well, what if you have intimate relations with your spouse out of forgetfulness? Is that possible? Because in order to have intimate relations with your spouse, it has to be two people the male and the female both agreeing and both engaging in and those acts. So the scholars, they say that, yes, it's possible that it can happen that both the husband and the wife can forget that they're fasting. They get caught up in, he in the moment and it's very heated and things like that, right? And they just lose track of everything that's going on. They're in love. They're on their honeymoon. They're newlyweds and things like this. They forgot they were fasting Ramadan, right? The scholars say that it's possible, but they say that it's highly unlikely, they say that it's highly unlikely because they say that if one person forgot, if the husband forgot, most likely the wife is going to remember and remind the husband, say, hey, we're fasting. Brother, we can't be doing this right now. We have to wait until after Maghrib or, you know, in the night or whatever like this, right? But they say that it is still um, possible, okay? So if it is done out of forgetfulness, if it is done out of forgetfulness, then it doesn't break the fast, nor does it require an expiation. Nor does it require an expiation. And this was the opinion 
of Sheikh al-Albani, but he said at the same time that it is very difficult that this could happen, that this could happen, that both of this, the spouses would be forgetful of it happening, okay, from both sides. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. And also Hassan al-Basri and Mujahid from the great Tabi'een, right, from the earlier generation scholars, they also had mentioned that whoever has intercourse with their spouse out of forgetfulness while they are fasting, فَلَا شَيْءٌ عَلَيْهِ then there is nothing upon him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay? So, so uh, uh, just to be clear, the Shaykh is talking about uh, someone having intimacy uh, with his wife in the times uh, of uh, Ramadan, in the times of fasting, like uh, in the hours of fasting. But... Uh, and and they do have to uh, uh, give expiation of those one, two, three that the Sheikh mentioned. But as for those who um, uh, break the fast intentionally, uh, there is no expiation, but it's a great sin. Right, Sheikh? Well, those who intentionally have intercourse with their spouses during Ramadan intentionally, then they have to pay an expiation, which is either freeing a slave, fasting 60 yeah, days yes, consecutively, uh, or feeding 60 poor people. Yep. No. And that is a major uh, What sin, about... Right? But out of yes, I'm, I'm saying... Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. saying someone who intentionally breaks his fast um, uh, in, the, in the hours of fast... Uh, uh, fasting um, and, and there is no expiation for that person but it's a great sin yes no alhamdulillah so next thing what are some other things that break our fast anybody else can give us some input Sami Muhammad how are you I hope you're well anything else that breaks our fast intentionally Unintentionally. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said that vomiting, vomiting intentionally or forcing yourself to vomit, this breaks the fast. But doing so unintentionally, this does not break the fast. Okay? How about other things that break our fast? Maybe some this issue right here is specifically related to our sisters, the women. Okay? Um, can any of them mention some of the things that may be particular or specific for our sisters which may break their fast in the month of Ramadan or will definitely break their fast in Ramadan and prevent them from fasting? Ah, the brother, he said, or Sammy said, uh, somebody who is on their menses. Okay? Somebody who's on their menses. So if the woman is experiencing her menstrual cycle, then she cannot fast then she cannot fast. Okay? Um, also, a nifas, also postnatal bleeding. She cannot fast as well. Okay? So, these are two of the things that are specific for our sisters. Okay? Uh, one I have of the, a question. Ah, good question. Does... Does the corona vaccine or donating blood break the fast? Okay, excellent question. So, remember the principle that we mentioned? Who can tell us? Uh, we'll ask the same brother who asked the question. Brother. <laughs> no, uh, the, the brother came, I think, late. No, he was there. I think he was yes. there. Okay. Yeah, okay. I've been watching him. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> brother Muhammad, yes. do you remember the principle that we mentioned about the things that break your fast? Um, it has to be in, uh, intentional, yes. Okay. Um, food and water. Okay. Um, Anything providing the body nutrients okay. consumed through the uh, mouth yes. intentionally breaks the fast. Okay? So now I want you yeah. to try to help us answer that question. <laughs> Go ahead. Hmm. Corona, so, corona vaccine. The, the corona vaccine. Okay, is now, it 
Does it provide nutrients or is it medicine? Uh, it's medicine. I don't think it provides any nutrients. You are right about that. Alhamdulillah. Right? It's not providing any type of nutrients to the body. It's just providing, right, as they say, antibodies so that they will strengthen the immune system or produce these antibodies in the body so that if somebody gets the coronavirus, it will enable the body to fight off the sickness quicker or easier or better. Alhamdulillah. Right? So that answered your question, right? So that also yes. answers any other question. What if somebody, you know, what if somebody uh, takes a needle of ibuprofen or something like that for a headache or takes a needle, they were in an accident or something like that, anesthesia or something like that, right? Local anesthesia. Does that break the fast? No. The strongest opinion is that no, it doesn't. Why? Because it's غير مغذية, right? It is not something which provides nutrients to the body, okay? And as for giving blood, okay, extracting blood, then we have the narration of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu he says that which breaks the fast is anything which is taken into the body not anything which is taken out of the body so giving blood is permissible does not break the fast also even doing the strongest opinion in regards to hijama doing cupping is that it does not break the fast as well and it is permissible to do cupping while you are fasting as did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as it came in the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma as well, that kana nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yahtajim wa huwa sa'im. And this hadith is nasikh of the other hadith, which talks, which says, aftar al-hajim wal-mahjum, where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the one doing the cupping and receiving the cupping have both, uh, broken their fast. But that is abrogated by the previous narration that I mentioned by Abdullah ibn Abbas where he said that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam did hijama, did cupping, while he was fasting. But he mentions as well, Abdullah ibn Abbas and some of the other righteous predecessors, they say that they used to like be cautious about doing fast, uh, doing cupping in the month of Ramadan out of fear that it will cause them weakness while they are fasting. Okay, because, you know, some people when they do hijama, whether it's on their head, their neck, their back, or whatever part of their body, sometimes they get nauseous, sometimes they get lightheaded and things like this. And this may cause you to what? To faint, to pass out, to maybe you have to take in some salt or take in some sugar and things like that, right? To get you back to normal, your energy and things like this. So you have to, right, look and see at your personal situation. Does Drawing blood from the body make you tired, so exhausted where you have to go and eat. If so, then maybe you shouldn't do it in the day while you're fasting. Maybe wait till the evening, right, or after Ramadan. But if you're able to, you know, function properly, right, doing hijama, doing cupping, or taking blood from your body, and it doesn't really affect you too much, then it is permissible to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Excellent question. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Any of our brothers on Facebook have any questions? Naeem Baker, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. Mustafa, salam wa alaykum wa rahmatullah. Mazin, I hope you guys are all well. We're here tonight. We're trying to cover as much as we can about the month of Ramadan. We're here with Imam Abdul Ahad, one of my great associates and fellow students of knowledge. Alhamdulillah, we got to spend a lot of time in Mecca together, studying at the feet of some great, great scholars. May Allah have mercy upon their souls and may Allah protect them and preserve them. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So what other issues, Imam, um, do we need to discuss and talk about? Uh, what about Qadha Ramadan, right? Making up Ramadan. We said that some of the things that break the fast or prevent our sisters from fasting is having their menses or postnatal bleeding. So, what is their situation, Imam Abdul Ahad? What should they do? Do they have to make up those days, or do they not have to make up those days? I it was uh, frozen. I don't know. I I only heard the, the beginning of the question and the end. 
Okay, so what about our sisters who are experiencing their menses or have postnatal bleeding? Do they have to make up the days that they missed or are they excused from making up those days? Yes, um, they have to make up those days that they have missed um, because of the narration where uh, someone came to our mother Aisha and uh, she said um, uh, why do we um, that the hadith where she got a little irritated and she said mm. Uh, remind me of the hadith like uh, how come we uh, we make up uh, Ramadan the missed days she said and we don't we don't make up the, the days that uh, we are when we are in our period uh, the salahs that we missed uh, and then the, this is where she got uh, a little irritated and um, uh, she said Oh, uh, yeah, uh, this is uh, how the Rasul uh, taught us and told us that uh, we should make up the days that we miss during our period, but we never used to make up the, the prayers that we missed. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah, Ahsan. So, if a woman is experiencing her menses or experiencing her postnatal bleeding during the month of Ramadan, then she has to make up those days at another time. She has to make up those days at another time outside the month of Ramadan. It's the best if she can make them up in uh, Shawwal. But if she can't, then she has the whole year up until the next Ramadan coming to make them up. And even if she cannot do it at that time, then she can make them up. So those will remain in her dhimma, right? Those will remain in her account that she needs to um, fast those days when it becomes easy for her to do so. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. What are some I things... Another question. Ah. Uh, a brother asking, what are the rules of fast for fasting while traveling? MashaAllah, excellent question. So, that will bring us... So, the question came up, what are the rulings, or what are the rules and related to the individual who traveling. may be traveling during the month of Ramadan? So, we have... In the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions, He says that if you are traveling, then you can make those days up at another time. So, from the conditions of those who it is obligatory upon them to fast is number one, the Muslim. Al-Muslim, Al-Aqil, Al-Baligh, Al-Sahih, Al-Muqeem. These are some of the important conditions. That number one, it is obligatory upon the Muslim to fast. It is not obligatory upon the non-Muslim to fast. Number two, somebody who is sane. In order to fast, you must be sane. You must not be crazy. You must not be schizophrenic. You must have your sanity. right? Somebody who is insane, it is not obligatory upon them to fast. right? If they are Muslim. Number three, Balik. They have to be at the age of puberty. They have to have reached the age of puberty. And there are signs that somebody, a young boy, has reached the age of puberty. What are those signs? Imam? Two signs? Of, uh, puberty, uh, yeah. Uh, for for uh, uh, a male. Boys, uh, yeah, there are uh, uh, three signs. And for, for female, four signs. Okay, what That's are the three? Boys. Uh, Reaching the age of uh, fifteen, okay, or growing uh, pubic hairs around the private part. Uh, this is two and three uh, is inzalud many. Ah, a wet dream. Uh, so wet three dream. signs for the male and four signs for the female. And the four signs for the female are those same three that we mentioned, with the yes. addition of menses, experiencing the menstrual cycle. So how do we know that somebody has reached the age of puberty and that it is obligatory upon them to fast? Number one, for the boys, if they have reached the age of 15. Number two, if they have pubic hair. Number three, if they have had a wet dream. Same three for the women and add one more on if they experience their menses. So once they reach that age, they have to fast. 
But if they are under that age, then it is not obligatory upon them to fast, but we encourage them to fast. Alhamdulillah, we train them to fast. So they must have, right? They must be at the age of puberty. Then, as-sahi and muqim They must not be sick. If they are sick, then they have the excuse to break their fast. But the type of sickness that they have has to be a type of sickness which is unbearable. Or a type of sickness in which if they do fast, it's going to increase their sickness. Then they can break their fast. Okay? And there's two different types of sicknesses that the scholars mentioned. One, one type of sickness is if somebody's sick and there is a hope, you know, and very high expectations that the sickness is going to go away. Right? Then the scholars say that. Right? Um, that the person should should try to fast and try to deal with it. Right? But if they cannot, then they still have the excuse to break the fast. But for somebody who... And they have to make up the day that they broke their fast, right? If it's a type of sickness that, that can be cured and things like that, right? But if it is a type of sickness which the doctors are saying that, that is the, you know, the, there's low expectations that you will ever be cured and things like that. And, right, science and, you know, you've tried many different cures and things like that. So, of course, the cure is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's always a possibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cure you, but... They say that if there's a you know a type of sickness which is you know terminal illness which you know most likely won't go away, then the scholars say that right you can you don't have to fast but you have to feed a poor person for every day that you broke your fast. So if somebody is sick, right, they have an excuse to break their fast. Then Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions right um, or some of the conditions and Allah mentioned it in the Quran, right, is whoever is traveling. Okay, whoever is traveling and on, or on a journey, then you can you can break your fast, right? You have the ruksa, right? You have the excuse to break your fast, okay? But we have to look at so that's the general principle that any type of traveling that you're doing, it is permissible for you to break your fast. But it is related to at the same time to mushaqqa, <coughs> hardship or difficulty. Okay, so if this journey is very difficult for you, right? It's it, it's making you exhausted and hungry and and tired and sick, where you're not able to perform or function your daily tasks normally the way that you are, then you can break your fast, right? But let's say you're traveling by airplane and it's very easy. You're only right on a two-hour journey in the airplane and it doesn't you know, really cause any mushaqqa, any hardship or difficulty and things like this. And you have, you know, you feel good. And, you know, it doesn't really take a lot out of you. Then it is okay for you to fast. So you have to, alhamdulillah, weigh out your own individual situation, right? Both are permissible to do. If you're traveling, you can break your fast and make it up on another day. Or you can remain fasting and continue fasting uh, during that day in the month of Ramadan. And both are, alhamdulillah, permissible for you to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And do you have to fast if you start traveling after suhoor time? Do you have to fast? Mm -hmm. If you have to travel after suhoor time? No. Same same ruling. Same I ruling. Think, uh, the question... Uh, says, um, uh, you know, um, some people they say, um, if if the person is traveling, and uh, before he started traveling, and, and he started fasting, and then then he hit the road and he started traveling, uh, is it permissible for him to break, or he should complete his fast? 